It is amazing what God is doing around the world and how we get to be a part of it in different ways, sometimes going, sometimes praying, supporting. So thanks, Karen, for sharing. And, and it is interesting because in, uh, in Mexico and in, in several places, there is actually a whole um, ministry open up. If you remember years ago, one of the big ministries was going to, going to China to teach English. Well, now China is also accepting people to teach Spanish. And so there's all kinds of missionaries that are going from Central America and to go teach Spanish in China. I think China has a vision for the world, not just for <laughs> America, right? <laughs> but, Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to be able to participate in your work around the world. We remember what uh, Mordecai told Esther, that with or without you, God's going to do his work, but who knows, maybe God put you here at this time for this reason. And Lord, you place us in places at certain times in our lives and different places in our lives, and you know what, we're, what you're doing, and we have typically not a clue. And yet we can trust your hand. We can trust your goodness. We can trust that you're working and that you know what you're doing, and and so we thank you and we praise you for that. We do pray for Karen that you'd be with her and go before her and continue to open doors and as she touches the lives of people where you've placed her, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your word and we ask now that you would just open our hearts, help us to hear, help us to understand, help us to apply what you would have for us, Help us to reflect on our own place in life and what you want to do and rebuild and maybe what you want to tear down and restore in our lives. So, Lord, just um, ask that you would do a work in our hearts and lives as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So your homeland was destroyed. It was brutally destroyed, completely destroyed. Cities in ruins. Buildings burned down, everything's torn down, any wild animal, a wolf, a thief, anything else can just come wandering through, take what they want, destroy what they want, uh, steal what they want. Uh, there is no worship of God. The temple has also been completely destroyed. The land has been left completely in ruins. In fact, you were told by the prophets that you should pray for the city where you were going, where you were going to be a remnant. You should go and and build houses and build lands because you were going to be there for a while. And now, as it turns out, you have an offer to go home. As it turns out, somebody says, you can go back. You can go back to what you were at. There's some promises of return. In Jeremiah 29.10, there was this promise of return to the land. In 29.11, the verse we saw earlier, that the promise for a future and a hope to rebuild you hear about that, you hear permission has been given to go back to a homeland. What do you do? Do you go back? But back to what? Right? Back to destruction, back to where you've been starting over. And, and what would it take to start over? I mean, if you have your laptop or your iPad or a video game or you get stuck like I do many times, you just, okay, let's just reboot it and we'll start over, right? <laughs> And so you just kind of reboot and you start over. How about how do you reboot a society? How do you reboot a city, a project, a church, indeed our own lives? How do we reboot our lives? How do we rebuild? And so the elders and we've and Alex and we've decided that in the next couple months we want to study the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and and a couple books where people did just that. They rebooted their lives, their worship, their city, they rebooted their society as well. We want to learn how they did it, and then how God worked in their midst. And of course, we believe that the Word of God applies and still speaks to us today, right? And so we can figure out and look at some of the historical aspects, but also the cultural relevance to us. The book of Ezra focuses on the restoration of worship in the midst of the persecution that went on. Ezra's an interesting book because it covers roughly 100 years. Uh, the, a little over 20 years is chapters 1 through 6. And then there's like a 55-plus year gap between chapter 6 and 7. And as you're reading from chapter 6 to chapter 7, you don't really stop and realize that there's over 55 years in that gap there. But there's a gap of almost 55 years, and that's where the story of es Esther falls into historically. 
And then Ezra comes in in chapter 7, and he overlaps a little bit with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is going to rebuild the walls, and he's a governor. He's going to focus on the city. Um, and, but Ezra, and Ezra is going to focus on this rebuilding of worship. But as we begin to start off, the, and it starts in Ezra 1, where they, they're going back to rebuild. And, and notice with me how it starts then in Ezra 1.1. 1, 1, in the first year of King Cyrus, king of, first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver, gold, with goods, with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Uh, where it says, in the first year, and some of your versions will say now in the first year. It's a Hebrew word, as also can be translated and. It gives us a clue that we're talking about a story. It's narrative literature. We're going to talk about a story. And a story about how God works in the midst of people's lives. The first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, it's not actually referring to the first year that he ever had power. But it's the first year of his reign in Babylon. See if Kyle points out that Cyrus conquers Babylon puts his father-in-law Darius in charge, then comes back a couple years later to start his own reign. In fact, Daniel 9 alludes to the fact that Darius was put in charge or he was made king. Daniel is active in the times, during the times of Darius, during the, and Darius um, is Cyrus's father-in-law. And so Daniel is active during this time. He's ruling, he's, I mean, he's reigning, he's in the court, he's involved, he knows what's going on. Daniel also... As we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel has an interest because he's reading Jeremiah and he realizes that the 70 years are almost up and God's going to do something. And so Daniel's there, Cyrus is there, Daniel knows about Cyrus, obviously. And so God begins a work in Cyrus's heart. Notice with me again then in verse 1, to fulfill the, word, the Lord's word spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of of Persia's King Cyrus. The Lord begins a movement and the Lord begins working. It starts with the work of God. When we talk about rebuilding, we start with the gracious hand of God. It starts by acknowledging God's gracious hand, God's sovereign hand that's working in the hearts and the lives of people. And certainly God is the main character in Ezra, but he's the main character in the Bible. Right? It starts with God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning... God, right? You look at, at Genesis 12 and you have Abraham. Abraham's not thinking to himself, gee, I wonder if I could go be a uh, camp in the desert for a while. Abraham's living in Ur of Chaldees. Ur of Chaldees is a great place to live. It's a place that has gold-plated silver. It has indoor plumbing. It has the best of the best of the best in those times. And God says, get up and I want you to wander to a place I'm going to show you about. It started with God. Moses, he didn't had no clue about what God was doing. In fact, he didn't even want to be a part of it. In, in the discussion in Exodus 3, Moses like, God, can't you just send somebody else? Right? It's like, no, it starts with God. God initiates. There's a work that God's doing. There's a work that God's calling. You think of David. King David is out in the sheep. He's watching some sheep. He's doing something. He's not interested in what's going to happen. I mean, he's not thinking about being king someday, right? He's just watching some sheep. And God says, Samuel, and says, I got somebody in mind I want you to go and talk to. It starts with God. You think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not on a mission trip when he went to Damascus and met Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, but God is doing a work, and God's initiating a work, and so it starts with God. He is the God of all creation, but he's also the God who's intimately involved with his creation. As David Shepard says, he says, the first verse of Ezra begins and ends with Cyrus. The syntactical heart is profoundly theological. Yahweh moved. Yahweh moved. It starts with God moving. And that's why, as James tells us, if the Lord wills, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other things. We can come up with a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts and plans, but one of the things we want to start with is, God, what do you want? 
What are you doing? What is your goal? What is your heart? How can we plug in to what God is doing and what God wants? Now, one of the things we see is that God fulfills his promises. God keeps his word, right? In order, notice as it says there in verse 1, in order that the word of God by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. And so God keeps his promises. He had spoken through Jeremiah. What Jeremiah had said was considered the work of God, was considered the word of God. And so that he could fulfill what happened through Jeremiah, he begins moving. Jeremiah had promised to return in Jeremiah 29.10 that after 70 years they were going to come back. There's a plan for a future. There's a hope that they're going to have and come back to this land. One of the things that we as a people, we can kind of have confidence in God's word, right? We can have confidence in what God is doing. We can have confidence in where God's moving and what God is doing. And when we begin to cling to the promises of God, we can know that we're going to have a measure of success. Why? Because God is doing it. God is doing it. And so we can take God's promises and we can kind of sit back and say, well, I'm not going to do anything. Or we can take God's promises and we can go, cool, I get to be a part of changing lives. I get to be a part of what God's doing. I get to be, get to be a part of what God wants to do in the society around me in my own life. I get to be a part of that. Why? Because God is going to fulfill his word. Josephus writes that, that Cyrus got so enthused about the prophecy that had happened that he wanted to fulfill it. And the irony, of course, is that Josephus, you know, this prophecy about Cyrus, excuse me, the prophecy about Cyrus was made over 100 years earlier by Isaiah. Isaiah had no clue who Cyrus was. You know, Jeremiah never met Cyrus. He didn't know who Cyrus was. But they're both long gone, well off the scene. But God's made some promises and God is going to work in the lives of the people. So notice with me then when God begins to do a work and God begins to keep his word, what does he do? He moves people's hearts. He stirs up the hearts of people. God is the Lord. He's Yahweh. He's the personal. He's the covenant God. Cyrus is the king. Jeremiah knows nothing of him. Nobody knows anything. You know, all these, all these prophets that had foretold, they didn't, it's not like they met Cyrus and, and, and knew him, but they knew God, and God was working and moving in the hearts and the lives of these people. God is on his throne, and God is working, and even over earthly authority, God has the authority. It's interesting when we look at Nebuchadnezzar, because God had told the prophets, look, I'm going to let, I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar's own religion to get him to come and do the punishment that I want to have happen. And then now he begins moving in the heart of Cyrus to allow the rebuilding. Proverbs 21.1 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wills. That God wants to do something, notice with me then, he works with people. When God wants to start a movement, he works with people. It's interesting when we think about the gospel, right? And the gospel and the, and the God of Christ and the angels and all this majesty. And you think of Jesus on the cross and you think of all this stuff and all these people. What is God, how does God plan the proclamation of his gospel? Through people. He doesn't have angels somewhere, you know. I mean, I've been in Costa Rica. There are no parrots down there being trained to share the gospel, right? Um, there is nothing else. God works through people. So if your neighbors, if my neighbors, if people around us, people at work, the societies, the places we live, if they're going to hear about God, it's because we are going to get involved and we're going to share and work in the hearts of those people around. And God starts with people. And God starts with the people that are going to lead. And notice then he starts with Cyrus. And he moves and he stirs up the heart of Cyrus. So Cyrus makes his proclamation. So it starts with people, but then it goes on, moves on from there to an open door to rebuild. God starts with leaders and then he uses them to open the doors. There's a permission to rebuild. There's a freedom to leave where they're at. And so notice what he says here. He has this proclamation. He puts it also puts it in writing. The writing was very important because, because that was the official law of the Medes and the Persians. So later on, when we get into chapter 4 and we look at some persecution and different things that happens, they're going to write back to say, is this actually what this guy wrote and what he said? So years later, after Cyrus is long off, off the scene, what he had written still stands, and they go back to what was written. And so he puts it in writing, and they have legal authority then to go back 
Notice then what he says is he gives permission for them to return. Verse 3, whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, let him go to Jerusalem. And so he gives permission, gives the freedom to live where they are. Remember, these are conquered people. They were slaves. They were people that had been captured, kidnapped, right, in some senses. But now they're given the freedom to go back. That means that wherever they're at, wherever place they might find themselves, whoever was thought they were their owner, whoever they were working with or along with, they now have the permission to go back and to leave that place and go back to their homeland. So Cyrus gives them permission to the interesting parties to go back. Notice not only does he give them permission, but he also gives them authority. He gives them the authority to go back and to build this house in Jerusalem. Um, whoever wants to go back, it's important. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But he puts this proclamation in writing, and he gives them the authority to go back and the authority to begin to build and to rebuild the fo- uh, to rebuild the temple and rebuild the worship of God in Jerusalem. So then, notice with me that it's not just a matter about going back and rebuilding, but there's also a focus to it. There's a focus to rebuild. If we're going to rebuild anything, we need to understand what, what is it we want to rebuild. Why are we doing it? What do we want to accomplish, right? As the Cheshire Cat said to Alice, if you don't care where you're going, it doesn't matter which road you take, <laughs> right? And so if we care about where we're going, then we care about which road we take, right? We care where we're going to end up. What do we want to accomplish? What do we want to do? What do we want to, at the end of the day, what do we want to be? There's a focus and there's a purpose in going back. And notice with me then the focus and the purpose here is the restoration of worship. We're going to talk about rebuilding the walls. We're going to talk about setting the gates. We're going to talk about rebuilding the society. We're going to talk about all the different things that we see later on in Ezra and in Nehemiah. But notice with me that the starting point is the worship of God. The permission is to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild a house for God. Now, it's not that God needs a house, right? In fact, originally when they wanted to build the temple, God says, I don't really need a place to live. You know, heaven is my throne room. The earth is my footstool. It's not like God needs a place and God really is out in the cold. You know, he's homeless and he needs somebody to go build him a house. Right? What does building the house represent? It represents the restoration of worship of the creator God of the universe. And so when we come back to focus, when we come back to understand that one of the things we want to do is we talk about rebuilding and we talk about starting things over. We want to start with the rebuilding of a worship and a restoration of the worship of God. It starts with worshiping God. It's so easy, you know, to get sidetracked. Remember when we first went to Costa Rica and you get down there and there's immigration, and there's housing, and then there's internet. You try to contract and then you try to find this and try to find that. And how do you pay your water and how do you do this and how do you do that? And how do you teach and how do you get involved and how do you do all these different things? And now that we're coming back to the States, you know, it's like, okay, now I got to get this. I got to get that. We got to do all these different things. We got to do all this different stuff. There's meetings. There's this. There's that. There's things to buy. There's things to look at. It's really easy to get sidetracked. It's really easy to get involved in the day-to-day of doing things that we forget about the worship of God. Forget about spending time alone with God. We forget about, you know, letting God speak to our souls and fill our souls. It's kind of ironic, but it's so easy to get so involved in ministry that you forget about who you're doing the ministry for. And it's easy to get so involved. And sometimes we can get sidetracked if we're not careful. In fact, we'll see later on with Haggai when he's talking to them about how his challenge is you've got to get back to building the temple. Because it's so easy to get sidetracked in our lives. But the rebuilding, the rebuilding then of the temple is this restoration of worship to understand that our number one priority, when anything we want to do, anything we want to accomplish, anything we want to build, anything we want to reboot, anything we want to start, It starts with worshiping God. We start with the worship of God. You know that? 
It's just so easy, you know, got to get a car, got to get this, got to get that, got to get the other, got to have a job, got to do these things, got to do those things. Got to. It's so easy in our lives, you know, we, we think about our kids and they, well, you got finals and you got, you got exams and you got this and that and the other. And you've got all these things going on in our lives and those things are deadlines, right? And sometimes we have these different deadlines in our lives. And so as we have these different deadlines in our lives, we think about, well, God's always there. I can do that later. Right. God's he's going to be there. He's not going anywhere, you know. And so oftentimes we can almost take it too casual to where we we lose the focus of coming back and restoring. First of all, any project we want to do, anything we, wanna, we come back to restoring a worship of God. Now, the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of worship also implies a restoration of mission or restoration of purpose. As Christopher Wright says, Israel existed as one nation for the, in the world for the sake of God's mission of blessing all the rest of the nations in the world. In the restoration of worship and the restoration of the city, God is reaffirming his plan. His plan that, that through Abraham, the entire world would be blessed. His plan of redemption of all the nations, his plan of continuing to work with Israel. Today, God, in using his church and building his church, the church is an organized body of believers desiring to carry out God's plans. See, it's not just a matter of us having a nice little place to come meet, right? It's not having our own little special social club. It's not having our own little little group or our own little thing, our own little home fellowship where we all get along. And it, It's nice to get along in your home fellowship. Um, <laughs> it's not, but, but it's more than that, right? It's more than a country club. It's about restoration of mission. What is it that God wants us to accomplish? And what are we going to do? There's people to touch. There's lives to reach. There's missionaries to be sent out. There's, there's work to be done. There's a mission to get involved with. And, and notice with me is that we're plugging into the mission of God. It's not a matter of us coming up and saying, okay, God, what's my mission? Now, certainly we can say, God, what's my part in this mission, right? Because I don't invent my part. God, God gifts us, God calls us, but, but it's a matter of us plugging into the mission of God. God, what do you want to accomplish on this earth? What do you want to accomplish through our church? What do you want to accomplish in my life? God, what is it that you have for me? One of the things as you go through the issues and you go through stuff, one of the things that helps us the most is when we can come back and step back and say, I don't know much, but I know God's called me here. You know, I don't know what's going on and I don't know what's happening, but I know this is what God has for me right now in my life. And there's been times in our, in our life and there's times in, you know, lives of my parents and other people I know um, when you're involved and you're doing ministry. And, and, and sometimes the only thing you know is that God's called you. And the only thing you know is that God has a mission and you're plugging into God's mission. But notice again then with me as we go on in, this, in these verses. Notice with me that if you're going to rebuild, it takes people to rebuild, right? Um, you can have leaders. You can have permission. You can have focus. You can, in fact, oftentimes we do that, right? We have nice little mission statement, focus statement. We have nice little things. We put them up on little things. We put them in bulletin. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we put them everywhere. But do we do them? <laughs> right? Do we actually say, okay, now we're going to get to work? I remember one time somebody visiting at, my, at the church and he had all these great ideas. I go, you know what? That sounds like a great idea. Why don't you lead that up? He goes, well, I'm not going to do it. And I said, do you think I'm sitting around here waiting for people to give me ideas? <laughs> when people heard that, they just laughed at me. They just had to laugh because the one thing everybody knows about me is I have way too many ideas of my own. My wife can tell you that. And and I have way too many ideas. She's just, you know, trying to keep up. She's like, she's kind of figured out. After a while, I'll just sit back because Steve will go on from that idea to another idea. And, uh, and, and we'll see when he finally he settles down, then we'll talk about it. You see, so you can have all these great ideas, but what do you need at the end of the day? You have to have people that want to build, right? You have to have people that want to build, people that want to work. And notice with me is you don't want just warm bodies, right? You want people who are willing People that are invested. We know from Ezra 7, this is approximately a four-month journey. Four months, right? 
What are you going back to? You're going back to nothing. You're going back to something that was destroyed. You're going back to ashes. You're going back to maybe weeds and ashes because the last 70 years, weeds have grown over the ashes, right? And so you're going back really to nothing to rebuild and to start over. And so you need to have people who are willing to rebuild, people who are willing to work, people who are willing to sacrifice, people who are willing to have their own interest and their own investment in, in going back and seeing this redone. And you have to do it with people that want to do it. Have you ever noticed the difference between people that are like obligated and people that want to? And people that want to put their heart and soul into it. Tom Landry once said, he said, a second rate play wholeheartedly pursued is better than a first rate play half heartedly pursued. And, and so we have to come back and, and work with people that say they want to work. And notice with me as he says here, as Cyrus says here, whoever is among you, notice what he says in verse 3 whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. And so he has these people, and he has all these people that he's invited, he, people that are invested, people that have a personal relationship with God. It's not just, you know, adventure seekers, thr thr uh, um, thrill seekers, rebuilders, whatever, but it's people that are committed to going back and to restoring the work that the God of heaven has called them to do. Now, not everybody went. Some of the people had great lives. Some of the people were happy. They were living well, and they were doing well in Babylon. In fact, in, second, in Peter, when pa Peter writes, there's a discussion as to, as to what Jewish community might have been in Babylon. And um, because there's a lot of people that went there and started doing really good, like, well, hey, life is good for us. We're not going back. But there were people who were committed, people who wanted to see the, the worship of God restored, people who wanted to see the mission of God restored, and so they go back, and that brings us to the last point, which is people who are supported. People who are supported that have the resources for the journey. You know, it takes money. It takes time. It takes resources. And so notice with me then that he says, let everybody who goes. You, go, you guys want to stay in Babylon? Fine, stay. Help the people that want to go. Let them be assisted by the men of this place, whether they're gold, silver, goods, with beasts. So they went back fully prepared to start and to engage in the, in the land that was there. When we support missionaries, when we get involved in missionaries, we don't want missionaries that just can get there. We want them to be able to do something when they get there, right? So there's ministry funds, there's other things involved, there's other expenses involved. And so God is calling these people now to come back and to be supported by the community that's going to stay. And it's interesting because um, through the grammar and through some different stuff, we can see that some of the people that are called back to stay are going to support and they're going to give. Even people that aren't Christians are going to give or, or non-Jews non are going to give. But the people that do the work are people that are committed to God. Committed to reestablishing the worship of God. Committed to reestablishing the mission of God. Committed to saying, God, we want to do what's on your heart and we want to accomplish what you have for us. What is God calling you to participate in this mission? Notice with me that it says, the text says that the Lord stirred up the heart of Cyrus. And then in Goal, later on it says that it's the people whose hearts God had also stirred up. Because God begins to stir up people's hearts. And God says, I'm calling you. I'm working in your life. There's something in you. And we begin to stir up and say, is, is it possible that I could plug in? Is it possible that there's something for me? God has ways for us to participate in. So when we think about rebuilding, we think about restarting, we think about this new year that we're launching off in, in our lives, we want to start with the worship of God. That we plug into God, we plug into His worship. And then we say, God, what part do you want? What slice of the action do you have for me? What do you want of me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Thank you for the testimony that we heard earlier this morning, Lord, and thank you for Karen and the work that you're doing and how you're working and how she's, you've closed one door for her, but you're opening another door. And Lord, as we think about our own lives and we think about 
things that are going on and the things that we work through. And we think about going back. We think about rebuilding. It's so easy just to be comfortable and stay where we're at. But you call us and you work in us. So, Lord, we would ask that you would continue to do a work in our hearts. Continue to rebuild us for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve.